Hi everybody, welcome to week number two, Social Work 541. Please excuse, excuse my voice, I've been using it a little too much over the last couple of days. We are going to take um, just a few minutes to go over a couple of concepts from this past week's readings and to highlight a few from this week's readings. The first concept I want to touch on is the definition of social and economic justice. One important aspect presented in the readings was that of participative justice, an essential element of social and economic justice. This means that justice goes beyond the idea of fairness. It means that justice ensures that marginalized populations with whom social work traditionally works have equal or enhanced opportunity to meaningful participation in the structures in society that impact them. Participative justice means that all people, especially marginalized populations, have access to meaningfully contribute ideas. This is not token participation. This is ensuring access to actually contributing to changing societal structures. Our job as social workers is to constantly seek out ways to facilitate the meaningful participation of underrepresented groups, even within our own social agencies and organizations. And we need to critically examine and be willing to deconstruct the distribution of power that allows some voices to be heard and others to be excluded. Macro social work skills involve developing the ability to navigate tensions in communities, organizations, government, and other social structures around advocating for the fair distribution of resources, as well as the distribution of power and decision making. This sometimes places social workers in the awkward but necessary tension um, in the role of operating in a space where we sometimes simultaneously depend on the status quo for our own well-being of our organizations financially and with funders, as we also advocate to change it. That's a tension in which we operate as social workers. This is important because it's precisely that space where we can sometimes shy away from participation in macro social work or from advocating, advocating for change in power and decision making or for the inclusion of different groups in our social structures and organizations. These re readings really highlight the need to do that. The netting reading underscores this tension very well. Uh, one passage in particular that I wanted to highlight says, um, the number of struggles that have occurred in the history of radical social work in the US. These include the move from cause to function, the tension between liberals and radicals, and perceived incompatibilities between radicalism and professionalization. This part is particularly important. They conclude that it is not enough to use words like empowerment, multiculturalism, oppression, and social justice. The test of social work's commitment to its underlying values lies in the willingness to struggle on an often mundane, day-to-day -day basis to translate these values into deeds as our professional forebears did individually and collectively. I think this really gets at the idea that social workers have a responsibility to be aware of the ways in which our practice either contributes to the daily embodiment of our values or contributes to harm in communities. This reading emphasizes the importance for us to be aware that in the work of creating change, we need to focus on the process and also the players in order to incorporate mission into the change effort. That's highlighted further in the netting reading, where they say the future of macro social work lies in recognizing that change, like power, can be used in positive as well as in destructive ways. As social workers, it's our responsibility to recognize our role in creating positive change and also recognizing when, if we do not take those values seriously, we can contribute to further harm in communities. Taking these principles and looking at the basic premises of community practice and community organizing, I'd like to highlight some of those texts that deal with these issues. They really emphasize the idea of participative justice and the role of social worker as a facilitator of change rather than a resident expert. In community practice, the social worker's role is to help others identify the problems that they share, the solutions they seek, 
the players and actions they need in order to make that change happen and to ensure that the process fully involves the community itself. One of the goals of community organizing is to use the process of struggle itself to strengthen the community's capacity. The social worker as a skilled facilitator of bringing people together to analyze and explore their challenges and to come up with creative solutions. The process of coming together to discuss common interests can be part of the process of change, even if that isn't the final goal. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by these ideas. The KU Toolkit emphasizes the need for social workers to avoid becoming too comfortable with the conditions we're working in so as to avoid normalizing and accepting injustice. Um, there's a really great quote that I've highlighted here about even when the solutions that we're seeking feel like they are beyond the capacity of what the communities that we're working in are able to achieve, that doesn't mean that we should not continue to work towards those. This process is captured simply in the KU Toolkit. We ask ourselves, what is desired now in this place by these people? That means what worked 30 years ago or the solutions that were sought a decade ago might not necessarily be the same as they are today. It's important to define with every new configuration of a community group or community leaders to find out what the desired goals are now in this place by these people. How does this community define success? What conditions need to be put in place for things to improve? How can we create and sustain those conditions? That's how we start identifying the action steps that need to take place or the work that will be done in order to reach those goals. And then how are we going to know when we've achieved it? What does success look like for this community and how will we know when we get there? That sets up the framework for practice and it's going to set up the framework for being able to evaluate that practice as we'll get to further on in this course. So moving forward to this week's readings um, where we're going to be looking at community work as well as looking at political landscapes and how um, political life is embodied in different communities. The Millington reading helps define different types of communities. Um, they set up five different types of communities um, by the purpose that brings them together. So they list communities of interest, which are communities of people who same the sh share the same interest or passion, communities of action, um, which are people trying to bring about change on any particular topic, communities of place, um, which are brought together by geographic boundaries, and I think that's the one that we typically tend to associate with community, communities of practice, which are communities of people in the same profession or who undertake the same activities, similar to the social work community, community or the medical community, and communities of circumstance, which are people who are brought together by external events and situations. This week's readings um, really help to build upon the foundational definitions of social and economic justice and highlight your role as a social worker. Think about that as you prepare to analyze your communities for your assignments. This week's discussion forum is looking at local politics. It's for you to help us understand the political landscape of your community. Who formally represents you? What are some of the political motivations of your community? Help us understand what voting looks like, what party politics look like in your local community, in the state that you live in, how they represented in the national election, um, who are the actual people, and what contributes to these people being in elected positions. Um, do they fit in with the overall culture, um, the political culture of your community? Does it seem like an anomaly? What does it mean for them to be representing you? And then for your response, you're going to be responding to two of your classmates about the similarities and differences you see between the political landscape of your community and theirs. Um, and think about what factors um, are the same in that community and which factors are different. And then just a reminder, I've already posted guidelines about um, the assignment number one, but just a reminder that your presentations are due on Thursday of this week. Um, you'll be submitting them in the discussion forum, and then the response for 
um, that discussion forum will be a response to at least one of your classmates' presentations. If anyone has any questions about that, please feel free to let me know. Just a reminder, the rubric for grading is in your syllabus. If anybody has any questions about um, the kind of checkpoints for what to include in that, check your syllabus and also look at the video that was posted earlier last week. Um, I look forward to seeing your assignments this week. Um, I will probably be grading discussion posts uh, after Monday this week. Um, and I look forward to um, engaging with you and feedback about those. Uh, have a great week, everybody.